Good day and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this University of Bristol event, Humanizing Medicine with Azim Jawani and featuring David Nabarro. Azim is already with us and, and David will join us a little later into the call. And before we, we start with our introductions, I'd just like to thank uh, the support and promotions from the medical school, the Elizabeth Blackwell Institute, the MRC Integrative Epidemiology Unit, the Ismaili Mail, and the charity Public Health Pathways. We're, we're here to explore the topic of humanizing medicine through your recent memoirs, Azim, a book which I immensely enjoyed reading. And I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile just noting that I understand all proceeds in terms of royalties will be going to support populations in India, Pakistan and East Africa, which is which is wonderful to hear in terms of, of, of the effect that that can have. Today, before we begin, I would like to just uh, inform the audience, and, and again, welcome for joining this call, from the audience in, in regards to the agenda that we set out for today. Uh, so we'll have discussions, first of all, with Azim presenting, uh, then we will jump into a short discussion in regards to leadership, inequities, and the Aga Khan University. But we'd also like to field your questions and we do welcome you using the question and answer function here. Uh, if you can keep your questions short and clear that would be fantastic and, and do note down your name and where you are as, as it, it, it's always useful for us to have that context. So we look forward to that part of the call and then the final segment where David will join us he'll offer his reflections on the topic of discussion and Azim's memoirs. So that is the agenda and we're going to in a moment jump into look at Azim's presentation where he summarizes some of the key themes from his work but before I do that I would just like to introduce you uh, Dr Azim Giovanni so I mean thank first of all thank you for making time for this event um, and in terms of of what I've understood from the incredible achievements that you have, have led throughout your career it started in Makareri University in Uganda Thereafter, you actually traveled to Europe for training. Uh, you went to Norway. You, 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 you also attended the Karolinska Institute. In London, you, you visited a number of different institutions, including Ormond Street Hospital to gain your training and then further trained in Toronto General Hospital. So there is a, a, a broad range of experience that you, you gained before in the mid 80s, you, you traveled to Karachi in Pakistan, where you helped develop what the, the first Aga Khan University, which had already been set up at that time. And as director of, of the community health clinic and later the medical director, you, you set up as a professor and you worked in Tanzania later, setting up networks across Central and Southern Africa. So it's, it's wonderful to hear this range of experience that you bring Azim and also now I, I believe you're holding a clinical professorship at the British Columbia and, and a visiting professor at the Aga Khan University. So as we, we go forward, and, and as I said, I, I, I immensely enjoyed reading your memoirs. I would like to, to turn to you, Azim, um, for you to present on, on, on your, your recent memoirs, Humanizing Medicine. So I will share my screen and um, do tell me when the next slide should appear, Azim, and, and, and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Theo. Um, uh, I want to say how, how deeply honored and privileged I am to be invited to address your very prestigious institution. And, and I'm told that there are a number of uh, outstanding um, participants who are joining in. And I'm delighted to, to be, have the honor of being invited to this. Um, I want to start by just saying that uh, I'm essentially a, a general medical practitioner who got drawn um, uh, quite serendipitously into areas of, uh, uh, of action and activities some decades ago into engagement with aspects of healthcare in parts of the world and also in um, understanding, trying to understand effects of health and development, um, medical education and institutional capacity building. That is how I, I got my start. Um, 
So today, my main topic really revolves around what is the relationship between health and development and what is the role of an academic institution in this relationship? And if a university takes this question seriously, it places immense demands on the institution, but it opens immense intellectual and moral challenges as well and opens avenues and opportunities to the development process, which could otherwise remain unexploited. It requires that as an institution that you examine the potential of your institution for linking in effective ways with these problems. And this in turn brings the university face to face with puzzling dilemmas, traps and conflicts from which there is no ready escape. So why dilemmas? Well, quite simply because the problems of underdevelopment in the developing world are so serious and pervasive that to address them seriously pulls the university beyond its traditional activities and even locations of new and unfamiliar grounds. And that means that you are now on taking on far greater roles than your traditional universities are, are want to doing, not only in the developing countries, but even in the advanced countries of the world. So how did I get into all of this? And what is the, the issue? Um, if you look at the first slide there, um, humanizing medicine, you notice that, that the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical and mental wellness, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This is the original description, uh, and some would call it in the utopian um, dream, but it is something that we keep on targeting ultimately for the good of the world. But the health itself is a very complicated issue. How do you define optimum health? And, uh, you know, there are many determinants of population health and its health is a very complex, massive process with multiple social, economic, cultural, and technological dimensions. And it is impacted and interconnected with multiplicity of other factors such as poverty, quality and availability of healthcare and education, change, climate change, uh, environmental degradation, um, loss of biodiversity and habitat, uh, as well as poor housing conditions, habitats, overcrowded housing, as well as the world that we live in, which is a very interconnected world, leading to global trade and uh, population movements. There has been over the period of time, a great deal of degree of disparity between the growth in parts of the world. Some parts have done, as you know, the, the Western industrialized nations have made tremendous project progress over the last one to two centuries, whereas in some parts of the world, uh, the progress is just starting only about five decades ago. So there are other impacts on healthcare, such as demographic shifts, um, socioeconomic and technological problems, geopolitical conditions, and both by inheritance and by, by its own foundations, weak um, civil society institutions, lacks ethical and, and legal frameworks, corruption, public policy deficits, all of these have an imprint on the state of health. Um, but apart from that, there have also been um, imprints of history left behind in many parts of the developing world, such as 
history and legacy of colonialism, slavery, racism, exploitation of people and resources over decades, and it left behind a weakened societies. A lot of this was done for the material enrichment of the few, uh, which led to widening income gaps and inequalities and power imbalance, not only within um, the countries, nations themselves, but between different regions of the world. Next slide, please. So what is the causes of morbidity and mortality in that part of the world? And I'm talking here essentially about countries in parts of Asia and Africa, as well as in Latin America and some, some Middle Eastern countries and so forth, including places like Afghanistan. Well, there is certainly a high burden of, of uh, disease which are both infectious and communicable diseases, malnutrition, inadequate uh, access to clinical care. We are finding that many parts of the world are experiencing a double whammy, where there is a health in the, a, a epidemiological transition, where conditions and problems of the infectious and communicable disease are now uh, running side by side with the an explosion of non-communicable diseases and a disease of degeneration, cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and so forth. So the current setup where is also then compounded further by issues such as continuing armed violences, uh, conflicts between regions and borders, accidents and crumbling infrastructures, motor vehicle accidents, which account for about 40 to 50 times more injuries and death than in, in the advanced nations of the global north. Environmental pollution has become an increasing issue and a problem in those parts of the world. Next, please. Next slide. Um, so how do we bridge academic medicine and population health given the vastness of the problems that we have? Well, in, in, in brief, all these factors need to be understood to some degree by policymakers, by planners, and we need a a holistic approach that rests on ethical underpinnings and includes ethics of sustainability, environmental sustainability, pluralism, respect for human rights, empowerment, cultural restoration, and ultimately relief of poverty. Um, ethics of inclusion, compassion, respect for life, social justice, enhanced professionalism. These are the key uh, pillars on which population's health depends. The institutions and, and academic organizations and universities, main task then becomes intellectual pursuits in search of new and useful knowledge for the enhancement and of the quality of life and for betterment of people. This intellectual capital and knowledge societies of tomorrow um, for the purpose of creating competent and caring leaders in the social, economic, scientific, and professional endeavors. Next, please. Next slide. So, the, the main area of activity for an academic health sciences center is, I think, essentially to address unmet and uh, health needs and vast gaps, chasms in availability and quality of care to different segments of society, which care which has to be affordable, ethical, and, um, and sustainable, affordable, sustainable, and respectful. The institutions have a responsibility to seek 
to balance primary and secondary and community care with the advanced technologies that universities and university hospitals tend to house within confined walls, but which have very little relevance to the vast majority of people living outside those walls or who have little access to those, or those uh, technologies. And therefore, the university essentially has to reach out, put its hand out into the community. It cannot remain confined within the walls of, uh, of its own back, of its backyard. Uh, in other words, health beyond medicine is what is essentially required in the, in the progression of quality of life. Next, please. So, if you were to train doctors for tomorrow or health workers for tomorrow, what are the essential features and responsibilities that institutions have? I think ultimately it is to uplift the quality of care and education to the highest possible standard. Quality should not be compromised. No matter, even if you're trying to make the context of that education relevant, contextual and accessible. However, it, excellence cannot be given a short shrift simply because you have a larger demand. Uh, quality of care, quality of education needs to be benchmarked to the finest standards accessible uh, to that part of the world. And it has to seek to establish both undergraduate and and postgraduate and continuing development programs, which therefore have a spin-off effect to the larger and larger healthcare providers' numbers. And that responsibility of reaching out beyond your own students and your own learners, reach out into the community, the community health physicians, those who have had very little opportunity to upgrade their knowledge, to upgrade their this sense of uh, professionalism to upgrade and to have any kind of recourse or resource to continuing their sense of, of professional satisfaction. I think that becomes another critical element for the universities to be considering. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm closing here with uh, just a slide. You see that that is a, a health center built about 110 years ago on the island of Zanzibar. But it is today, it has been renovated in serves more as a museum than as a healthcare center. This was a, one of the earlier Aga Khan health centers in the island of, Tan, of Zanzibar in those days. Um, and today, it serves as, uh, as a multi-purpose education center as well. The other slides you see here is the, the reaching out into the communities by uh, the universities and the health services uh, staff into the communities to understand and to learn their, their true needs, as do the students in one of the earlier slides you noted that there were students going out into the communities, into the poorest areas of the community where they actually learn community-based medicine. And at the Aga Khan University, right from the beginning, in a five-year medical degree program, 20% of the time, right from the first year, was spent sending out and spending time to get to know individual families, to get to know communities, and to understand the roots of their issues. And therefore, they were constantly involved in educating and interacting with the public uh, at large. So with that, I think I will stop, uh, Theo, uh, and maybe we can then do the next part. Thank you so much, Azim. Uh, I think 
the presentation was 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 fantastic and i also appreciate how you you you've provided some really practical points in regards to the the potential offered when a university does move as as you put it beyond the confined walls um, and reaches out to the community and what value what benefit that that can bring within society more widely and i think it's a nice point to to kind of um consider as 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 we move forward and, and i'll certainly cover it in 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 in, in this discussion as, as we just go forward here but before we do that I, I think one question which is informed from reading your book is around leadership and what what i felt was fantastic when reading it was the, the dozens of people whom you've worked with around the globe and and your careful portrayal of of their expert backgrounds and the impact that they've had and also their unique personal qualities and in one sense that feels in the spirit of your book is is, is your humanizing those people um in history in a sense and and also perhaps it's characteristic of your leadership style that is to validate the contributions of others before yourself which which raises the question when you took forward this leadership approach i mean what recommendations do you have for other leaders in healthcare and and indeed what effect do you think this inclusive leadership approach that you 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 have um shown us through your memoirs has had on those you're working with azim well first of all i must confess that uh or i actually i must say that some of the names that I mentioned were people who were involved in, in development and in health and development much longer than I have been. And, um, and they did started much earlier than me and they continued much longer than myself. And many of these are people who, who showed me the way and uh, I would not have any, I mean, they've contributed to health and development education far greater than I have ever made. So I, I acknowledge that there is no way that a complex issue such as establishing a university's presence in, in this kind of activity can be done without concerted, coordinated and, and harmonized effects. And that means people have to have a common vision in a sense. They have to have a common mission. And um, they believe that they, that they have something to offer. I have always been very fortunate in that many of these have been my mentors. They've been my role models. And as from, from that perspective, I have learned the value of uh, cooperation and of giving voice to all in a team-based care uh, development. So none of this is really my own personal achievement uh, individually. Uh, second thing I would say is that the, the problems of, of issues and challenges that we are talking about are so vast that there's no individual or even a small group of individuals who have the answers or have the means or have the resources. And therefore, a coordinated leadership or rather led um, projects in which people identify the value and the mission and the goals clearly is, is critical. And that really brings down to the, the vision statement of the institutions that, that they belong to. Many of these are individuals and some like me have been mavericks, but by and large, uh, I think that uh, at all levels, whether it is at community level, at institutional levels, at national levels, or even at international levels, I think that leadership skills, um, uh, first of all, have to be brought in from an inner sense of passion, an inner sense of commitment, an inner sense of belief. Once it is there, then they are productive leaders and team players to start with. Thank you so much, Azim. And I think I think it's 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 excellent to hear that. And I, I, I hear, hear your points in regards to coordinated leadership and how you can, through having a clear values, mission, and goals, uh, you can align that and and you can you can build, as you said, 
one through the leadership, that inner sense of passion, belief, and, and I'd even go further and say potentially that gets transmuted, that gets furthered by by the staff themselves who who, who take on that challenge, who, who adopt mm -hmm. it and who embrace it through being included. So I think wonderfully answered, Azim. Um, but I, I, now I suppose to zoom out a little bit from the context of of um, leadership within the hospital sector, but focusing on the changing currents and, and, and the global health inequities that are stark currently. Um, we are facing a food crisis, which many of us have um, been considering. And, and I think David will, will offer some insights there as well in, in, in regards to his, his, new, his new position as the, in the global crisis response group. But I, I ask you, Azim, um, what I appreciated about your book was the diplomacy in which you covered history and, and health inequities. Um, you suggest we cannot separate the philosophical and ethical priorities of health. I, I agree with this. Um, indeed, I, I think it, it would be a gross dereliction not to appreciate all, all humans are equal. Yet, perhaps the status quo is, is slightly to the contrary. Um, and, and I suppose this invites the question, can we, we now be more assertive in our commentary on the coloniality of health? For example, I suppose drawing on Eugene Richardson of Harvard's recent publication in 2020, he writes, as an apparatus of coloniality, public health manages as a profession and maintains as an academic discipline global health inequities. Maybe we are now at a juncture which warrants and allows for stronger words. Uh, your book shows compassion is really required here, but also without addressing these inequities, Azim, do we unwittingly propagate the conditions that may manifest into a global apartheid? <laughs> well, you've been, you're bolder than I am in, in stating it. Uh what remains generally unstated. Um, I think in the global discourse on development, these are not things which have normally been brought out in the past. I am beginning to notice that people are, are, are more clear in their views now and are able to express that history has had a lot to do with the state of the world as we find it today. There's no denying that there has been a huge power imbalance over decades of not centuries. And colonialism certainly played a strong role within that. And when the colonial powers left, they left behind systems which were designed for privilege, for a privileged few. And that system continued, and it does continue in many different ways, whether it is in the public sphere or whether it is in the, uh, in the sphere of private enterprise. So the power structures have not significantly altered. Um, this, I think, is to the great detriment of the public at large. Universities are structured in that way. Public institutions in many respects are designed and controlled and essentially uh, under the, the hands of a, of a pluro plurocratic elite. Uh, many of them foreign trained, and they continue to propagate this notion of, uh, of uh, implied superiority that they have in terms of knowledge and experience and training. Uh, and, and naturally, they do not wish to see that power base changed. And I think that until that recognition is very clearly stated as one of the issues for why the world health it cannot be optimized, cannot be moved towards an optimization, is that this is amongst the, uh, one of the factors of fossilized, of ingrained and entrenched interests, which, uh, which do not allow change easily. And that was one of the struggles we faced. When I started out, I, I recognized very quickly that um, dealing with bureaucracy and dealing with structures was one of the biggest challenges in formulating new ideas and new thoughts and new directions. So yes, unfortunately the imprints of, and I wouldn't blame it all on colonialism by the way, 
many of them were left left behind some very good administrative techniques and just and fair causes. But I think the, the spin-off was that there was a, a power elite which have always lived by their entitlement, a sense of entitlement to govern. And this is continuing to be a problem and you see nationalism and you see expressed in many different ways. Uh, these are, are tensions which continue. Um, you know, the those disadvantaged have very little way of putting the, giving their input into the changes that they wish to see in their communities and in their countries. Resource exploitation is a classical example. It's in the hell of the few and the powerful and the politically connected. And those were legacies of the past. And I'm not saying that they, they cannot be changed and people have not made some attempt to change, but you hear that every day. And this continues to be an issue. Thank you, Azim. I think um, you make many points, and I think one of them that, that is important to highlight, I mean, it, it, it isn't solely the, 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 we shouldn't solely look at coloniality and colonialism as, as the cause of inequities, and there are other entrenched challenges to consider. Um, and I think that that's a discerning way to look at the situation, but also um, you, you do raise the urgency concerning how we do need to confront this. Moreover, I, I think it's a nice way to kind of segue it, it into what the Aga Khan University have done and, and to really consider in your memoirs that you show how the AKU, the Aga Khan University, sought to link, as, as you presented to us earlier, primary, secondary and tertiary health, both in Pakistan in your experience and in East Africa, you, you adopted an area-based approach, you designed around the local ecosystem, around the needs of the population, and, and, and that raises the question, I mean, through working with the Aga Khan University, how has that approach changed over the years, and, and can you expand on why pluralism is, is, is crucial in practicing medicine outside of, of the Western context? That's a, a big question and a big concern. And it has been from the time and even before the Aga Khan University was established. I think it is rooted in the fundamental ethics and the ethics and the value system that the, His Highness had promulgated um, and which formed the basis of the ethical framework of the Aga Khan Development Network at large. And that was respect for human rights, respect for equity, respect for sustainability, and for, uh, for human dignity, essentially. And when you go out as a new institution into a country and you say, well, these are our values. Well, people say, well, what's, what's new about your values? We've known about all this all our lives. But to bring that into practice, to bring a value guided ethical framework, which is essentially underpinned by a, a sense of a moral imperative for the world to be more even, to be more just, to be more equitable, I think is not an easy uh, task to, to enter into discussion with bureaucrats. And many of them will give you say, yes, we, we, we love this idea that you are bringing that civil societies need to be strengthened that they have a role in policy decision making, that they have a role in, de in, in, de in strengthening their own communities and in recognizing that they have the leadership potential themselves. This was never an easy task. So I think that the institution took a position that we need to develop prototype models in a micro, you might say a microcosm of communities where you actually demonstrate that uh, when communities work together, when they come up with their own issues and their own outline of their, their problems and pro propose solutions for them, and that you listen to that, and that, and that you cannot isolate health from education or from housing or from sanitation or from women's rights. These are all interconnected and influence each other. Poverty is the underlying basis of all of this. Marginalization. Um, exclusion from the mainstream of activities. 
And therefore, the models that we try to practice and develop in, in some small way was to create effective uh, prototypes, which the intent that these could be demonstrated to the world at large, to the national world at large. And by example, hopefully, other countries with similar issues can learn from them. That has been the history of the last 40 or 50 years in this particular project that I was involved with. So you might say that, that the moral and the ethical underpinning, the framework, was the founding or the guiding principle. But the activity had to be demonstrated, had to be convincing, had to be such that people could buy into it and, and, and accept that this is a valid way of promoting good social development. Thank you. Thank you, Azim. And I, I think um, important there to, to, to highlight how challenging that has been. And, and, and But there's also a lot of hope in that thought that you, you have put forward in regards to starting at that basis of the respect for human rights and, and locating poverty as, 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 as key in terms of how we, we consider moving forward. We have got a question and, and, and before David joins us, I'll, I'll, I, I'd love to, to ask you this from Shafiq uh, Azim. So first of all, wonderful presentation. And the question is how, how we prepare for the next generation or how do we prepare for the next generation of health professionals serves as a key determinant of health outcomes. Health professionals education is still focused largely on downstream interventions. What from your perspective and experience Azim, should be done differently so that future health professionals are prepared to address the broader social determinants of health? I think this is the key question. I have put more emphasis on, on, on training and development of health professionals than I have the, the more uh, broader political economic arena. And the reason simply is that I am by nature and by profession uh, an educator a physician, a practicing physician. So my understanding is from the perspective of an individual or a family within the community context in which they live. And from what I have seen and what I had noticed right in the early stages of my involvement was that by default, you might say, that most education institutions were frozen in time. Many of these were, as we said in the past, legacies of the colonial times, when the elite institutions were established, which were far removed from the realities of the outside world. And naturally, these were institutions which had considerable uh, leverage on, on public uh, policy and uh, were not willing to give up the state. So one of the challenges I found myself involved in was how do we bring in the new learners, or how do we reorient, remodel, redesign the education of the existing practitioners, not only physicians, but others, that they, they take a, a wider, a more humanistic, a more comprehensive look at the people that they serve. This was never an easy task. And so we started, and fortunately, leaders before myself had reflected on this issue. They realized that the, the medical school, if it opens in, in, in Pakistan 50 year, almost 50 years ago, 45 years ago, was that the curriculum has to be relevant and contextual to the people, to the needs of the people. That was the first and foremost requirement. The second requirement is that that has the science and the art of medicine have to be blended. It has to be informed by underlying principles of humanities. Uh, you can't teach compassion and humanities in an academic form quite easily. It is done, some people try and do it. Um, and I think it is increasingly being recognized in some parts of the world, including in many Western universities that without a grounding in the basic humanities and understanding of wider socioeconomic issues, 
you cannot be a health practitioner because you're you're focusing your energy too narrowly um so we were determined right from the beginning that the trainees get grounding in this so many of the students will come from very upper class families they've never been into these areas of utter deprivation they were shocked to see the conditions in which families and individuals lived but they had to adapt they understood that this is the world that i have not known of and that is where i need to make a difference so i think the attitudes the reorientation the founding underlying principles these were our tasks and then we carried it forth forward all our postgraduate programs and particularly the ones that i led which were broader postgraduate four or five year degree advanced degree programs which set a very firm basis on which people were trained and educated to 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 blend these different requirements most medical schools in the world and i have been to many many tend to be so focused on curricular structures that we need to deliver this piece this this piece this piece we wanted to move to problem based reflective continuing learning rather than loading people with tons of information which they are likely to forget this thank was the position we found when we entered into those areas thank you thank you so much azim and i think it's um also a useful juncture to to invite david to the call i think i think what you what you what you highlight azim is the the transition that's that may be required and, and needs to be considered with regards to to the pedagogy to 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 considering it more widely i think over the phone you 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 highlighted to me we need a more global view of global health and and also it needs to be locally and contextually relevant um david it's 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 wonderful to have you here thank you so much for joining i i i i, I always feel you need a little introduction but yeah uh, if no introduction there. please yeah. <laughs> Over, over to you, David. Thank so, you. hello. Uh, I'm one of these bureaucrats uh, um, who started out actually in the uh, late 1980s in Dar es Salaam, going and visiting the Aga Khan hospital there and being super impressed by what I saw. And when I found myself reading Professor Jiwani's book, I, I found it just beautiful. And I really want to encourage everyone who's involved in medical education to invite their students to get hold of this. What I did was I bought it on uh, Amazon and I read it on my Kindle reader. And I started reading it. And before I knew, I was about 150 pages in. And then I got really excited as I got towards the end and I realized just how deep and how broad Professor Giovanni's interests and reflections really are. So I wrote a few notes in my notebook about what I wanted to say. It's a bit difficult because I'm also so affected by what I've just heard that it may be that I will not be able to stick to my prepared notes. So I'm going to say now what I hope that everybody who's listening and who might see this uh, as a recording will, will do in response uh, to my remarks and to, most importantly, the wonderful presentation by Professor Giovanni. Just buy it, read it, pass it on, and try to make sure that everyone going into or contemplating going into medicine, into nursing, into all the caring professions has a chance to just reflect on the wisdom in this beautiful book. On page 238, there's a quote from Kafka, Franz Kafka. If we knew we were on the right road, having to leave it would mean endless despair. But we're on a road 
that only leads to a second one and then a third one and so forth. And the real highway will not be sighted for a long, long, long time, perhaps never. So we drift in doubt, but also in an unbelievable, beautiful diversity. Thus, the accomplishment of hopes remains an always unexpected miracle. But in compensation, the miracle remains forever possible. So you see, we never know whether we're on the right road. We never know we're on the, whether we're on the big road of life. We never know whether in what we do, the miraculous change for which we hope will somehow come real. But even at Professor Giovanni's age and at my age, we're both towards the end of our professional lives. We know that the miracle may still happen. It may happen when we're no longer here. You see, my stories a bit similar, but a bit different. I started out working in non-governmental organizations in many different countries. And I also worked extensively in East Africa, which is how I came across the AKDN. That's the Aga Khan Development Network. And then I was fortunate that I got into the global bureaucracy and moved into the World Health Organization, focusing on malaria, and then into the United Nations, focusing on pandemics and food security. That's why Teo said that I'm interested in food. And so I had the opportunity to try to connect what I was seeing in my healthcare practice particularly in East Africa and in Southeast Asia. And then as I got into the bureaucracies, it was my intention to try to bring this focus on inequity as a primary cause of ill health and deprivation in front of the decision makers and to say to them, come on, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about the fact that there are still these horrendous inequalities in people's opportunity for education, for health, and for well-being, for housing, for water, for justice, for the realization of their rights? Are you really, you decision makers, prepared to tolerate a life where 5% have an incredibly comfortable standard of living, like I have, and 25% have a really low quality standard of living, the very poor. And do we, do we tolerate this when there's so much wealth in the world, there's so much food in the world, there's enough water in the world? Do we tolerate these inequalities? And of course, I found as I progressed as a bureaucrat that I combined with perhaps several hundred other people who felt the same in public health and several thousand people who feel the same in the World Health Organization and in the United Nations, tens of thousands of people but despite the fact that we are with many, many millions and millions of people working for a world that is based on equality of opportunity and equity and fairness in the way in which people are treated, we are struggling. According to Hans Rosling, in an amazing book called Factfulness that was completed just after he died of pancreatic cancer. According to Hans Rosling, 
things are definitely getting better. If you look at the statistics, there aren't so many poor people in the world as there were 30 years ago. Life is an awful lot better for most people now than it was 50 years ago. There is the beginnings of much greater equality between women and men in many settings. But it's uneven. And so despite the progress, I think that what Professor Giovanni says to us is just we've got to do better. And those of us who have the gift of working in the caring professions, we've got to do a lot better. After all, our professions give us the opportunity to be working for people and to be trusted by society and sometimes paid good money for it. So if we're working for the people and respecting that WHO definition of health that was held up at the beginning, then we should be the loudest and most uncompromising advocates for fairness, for ethics in decision-making of all. We should be fighting hard for action around climate change because we see with our eyes that farmers in Kenya, farmers in Tanzania, farmers in Karamoja, farmers all over Somalia and Ethiopia are just unable to produce enough food because they've had yet another rain failure, which is caused by climate change. And they haven't contributed to it at all. But in their millions, they're experiencing the consequences. We should be speaking out loud. And so to finish, just what I really enjoy from how Professor Giovanni approaches things. It's people-centered. It's just all about the person. And everybody has value, everybody. There's no hierarchy, all the same. It's about putting global health right front and center inside the political discourse, about not being frightened of politics and how power is used, sometimes awfully cruelly, sometimes incredibly beautifully. But let's just recognize that power is incredibly valuable. And so arguing for power to be used properly is what we have to do. And you do it brilliantly so. Putting sustainability, pluralism, and ethics at the center of healthcare and public health. Of course, we're all the same. What applies in Tanzania, what applies in Pakistan, applies in the United Kingdom, applies in the United States. Stop this silly division between developing and developed countries. We're all developing. We are all in the same pickle. And in fact, the so-called high-income countries have probably got rather more to do to sort themselves out than some of the poorer countries in our world. We see it time and time again. And then thirdly, let's teach and share all the time. It's only recently that I've become a teacher, Prof Giovanni. I, I got a job at Imperial College, part-time, but beautiful. And I've realized teaching is just not about telling people what they should think, what they should do, how they should behave. Teaching is about creating the space where people with multiple different points of view on what should be happening can come together and learn to work as a community, to share with each other, and most importantly, to enable each other to be better. Teaching is about enabling others to be better, but it's not me telling them how to be better. 
It's about creating those spaces, creating those opportunities. And then you're just enabling people to give of themselves because we all have that good spirit inside us. So thank you again for the most beautiful book, but thank you for a remarkable life, professional life. Still got masses to go, but what a lot and how wonderful of you to put it down in these very clear words. You are authentic, you are humble, but you are hopeful. And above all, you are a student of humanity. You love people and it shows right through your book. Thank you so much, David. Um, Azim, I, I wish to turn to you and, 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 and whether you have any thoughts on any of, of, of the wonderful words that David's had uh, to, to allow us to contemplate. Well, first of all, <clears throat> um, I, cannot, I cannot possibly put into words David's kindness and generosity in giving me the accolades which I barely deserve. Uh, I mean, I have, I've known David's work, he may not know mine until now, but I have been extremely impressed that he is a clinician how he started out into his work and, and, and in making difference to the world. In his simple words, his directness has, I think has got such depth that I cannot possibly do anything more than that. I cannot add anything further. I do absolutely underline and underscore what David has already referred to, that given opportunities, people find solutions. You need the space, you need the opportunity, you need the, the conditions around it, an enabling environment which enables people to grow, to solve their own problems. They don't need imported solutions for everything. And the West is not a repository of all knowledge or all wisdom by any means. And yet people look to solutions only from one source or another. Um, the other thing that uh, David underlined, which I strongly agree with, is the drainage, the drain of material resources and intellectual resources into activities of destruction rather than of construction. When you look at how much more you spend on industrial, in, in military industrial complexes, Consider, compared to what is spent in, in building health structures or education structures around the world. This is a shocking difference. And yet when we need the resources, there's always excuse, well, we are in a recession or we're in a pandemic. I can tell you the world community has the resources to ensure that the fruits of health progress are shared more equitably by all of humankind. In reality though, health attainment within and between nations has fallen tragically short of this promise. And the reasons are that these are, are, are structures which nobody wants to change or challenge or to dare to challenge. Thank, thank you so much, Azim. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of time um, and I'm, I'm, I'm here really just to, to thank you so much, Professor. Azim Jawani, you 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 put down your memoirs. David has so articulately expressed the importance of this book, and 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 um, Professor David Nabarro CB, I'm thanking you so much for for joining this call. Uh, it's a privilege, as the Ubuntu proverb says, "The youth may walk faster, but the elderly know the road." I, I wouldn't say either of you are elderly, but I would say that there is a, a an abundance of wisdom in in in, in on that you both offered and. I thank you so much for the time you've given. David, you, you mentioned how medicine as a profession is, 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 needs to be the loudest and the most uncompromising on ethics, on climate and more. And Azim, I'd like to close on a quote from your book where you write on medicine as a profession, it presents almost limitless frontiers, which affords an unparalleled panorama of human condition, its riches, frailties, hubris, and potential. 
So thank you so much for all joining. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you. Thank you, Azim. Thank you, David. Um, your, your time has, has been greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for joining and um, have, a, have a wonderful day, uh, evening and morning. Goodbye.